In season one of Sound Euphonium, Reina Kosaka convinces protagonist Kumiko Omai that you can become someone special by playing music. But then, season two seems to deconstruct that very notion. Time and again, Kumiko learns to see the various geniuses around her for the ordinary mortals that they truly are. So by the end of her first year at Kitauji High School, Kumiko is left disillusioned. Are the hopes and dreams that Reina promised her idle fantasies after all? That brings us to the film Chikai no Finale, or Our Promise A Brand New Day, the next installment in Kyoto Animation's Sound Euphonium anime adaptation. Chikai no Finale is in many ways the low point of Kumiko's story. As she enters her second year at Kitauji, Kumiko is the most lost and conflicted she's ever been. And just as earlier in the series, Kumiko's development is mirrored by the orchestra as a whole, where her first year told the spectacular story of an underdog orchestra rising all the way to the National Concert Band competition. Her second year sees them failing to progress beyond the prefectural round. In other words, just like Kumiko, Kitauji as a whole has lost its direction. So that's what I'm going to discuss today. The story about Kumiko and Kitauji's fall from grace, and how that fits into Sound Euphonium's overall narrative. Hello, my name is Sean, and I'm thrilled that you're still sticking with me for part three of my Sound Euphonium series. Let's start from the very beginning of the film, where Kumiko's childhood friend Shuichi Tsukamoto finally confesses his love. Now, this confession scene is a far cry from a Hollywood-style happy ending. Kumiko is visibly shocked, and then we fade to black. And here's what's striking about the way this moment is handled. Even though it's clear that this is a point of no return, the film leaves us in the dark about the exact repercussions of Shuichi's confession. We're never shown what Kumiko makes of this, how she feels, or what she wants for that matter. And I think that's not just the result of Kyoto Animation cramming too much into an hour and a half of runtime. This is a very significant directorial choice, in that it creates for the first time a sense of distance between us and the series protagonist. At the start of season one, we might not have known everything about Kumiko and her past yet, but the anime makes it very clear how she felt about things and how she related to others from the onset. This time, however, we witness a key moment in Kumiko's life and we aren't even told what came of it. And yet, I think that this very confusion, paradoxically, better puts us in Kumiko's shoes than if we were to know her every thought. In essence, we aren't shown what the deal is between Kumiko and Shuichi, because Kumiko herself is lost and conflicted. In that regard, I think the first few interactions between the two are rather telling. Kumiko and Shuichi meet up, so is this going to be a date? But then, they only end up on the swings of a local playground, discussing club issues. Neither of them is swinging either. They're sitting still on a seat that's meant to raise people up into the air, just like how their relationship doesn't seem to be getting off the ground either. A bit later, Shuichi catches Kumiko at the train station, and just look at the amount of physical distance between them. And as they, again, discuss club-related topics, Kumiko is impressed with how much Motomu, who's one of the new first-year students, has opened up to Shuichi. For Shuichi, however, this isn't really a big deal. It's just ordinary human interactions. Kumiko proclaims that she must be hopeless then. Now, on the one hand, this consternation arises from Kumiko's struggles to get through to a first year under her auspices, and that's a topic I'll be returning to later. Yet, at the same time, it's hard not to see this as a comment about her relationship with Shuichi as well. How can Motomu open up so much to Shuichi while she is failing at just that? Now, to make it very clear, there's a lot at stake in Kumiko's romantic hesitations. 
I already discussed this in my Season 1 analysis, but her choice between two lovers throughout the story illustrates her stance towards life more broadly. Shuichi has been painted as the safe option. Kumiko would have always been able to date him without the slightest difficulty. Moreover, going out with her childhood friends is the ultimate symbol of conformity and continuity with her past. Choosing Shuichi, therefore, means electing a life without growth, a life without change. And on the flip side, there's Reina Kosaka, the path of radically rejecting societal expectations in favor of pursuing her individual dreams and aspirations. And even though the Kumiko of Season 1 doesn't fully understand what she wants, what she's yearning for, she knows that it's definitely not Shuichi. And so, by the end of Season 1, Kumiko could wholeheartedly side with Reina, against the crowds. But now, one year later, Kumiko's mind seems clouded with doubts. There's nowhere that makes this clearer than in the reprise of the hilltop scene. Now let me quickly refresh your mind on why this scene is so significant in Season 1. During the annual festival, Kumiko joined Reina to climb their local hill. The two literally separate themselves from the masses by rising up higher than anyone around them. And that's why this is the location of Reina's audacious declaration that she will become someone special. Flash forward one year, and this time around we see Kumiko with Shuichi, down below at the festival. And honestly, this is the only time in the entire scene that we get any semblance of chemistry between the two. So with this, the film consolidates the ideas from season 1. For Kumiko, mingling with Shuichi means surrendering her individuality and becoming part of the crowd. Yet, as the scene progresses, it becomes clear that Kumiko hasn't made up her mind entirely. Their date leads up to what, by all means, should be their first kiss. But as Shuichi closes in, Kumiko slams on the brakes. Apparently, they'd agreed to wait until after the competition. Kumiko clearly isn't ready to commit. And more than that, she has also promised to meet Reina. As it turns out, the conflicted second-year Kumiko is dividing her attention between her two prospective partners. There are few moments in fiction that have made my heart bleed as much as when I first viewed what follows. It's a scene where very little is actually said, and yet it's clear that something between these best friends has broken down. Honestly, the entire point is communicated through a simple color contrast. Kumiko in her white shirt, Reina in all black, as if she's in mourning. Two people who have drifted apart, their attitudes and aspirations completely different. Two people who have drifted apart, their attitudes and aspirations completely incompatible. To start with, Reina didn't even bother telling Kumiko where she was heading. It's as if she's somewhere given up hope and accepted that they'll drift apart. Kumiko has chosen to fool around with Shuichi, and thereby she left Reina all alone at the top. And more than that, only Reina brought her instruments this time around. Back in Season 1, Reina found in Kumiko someone to share her burden, which manifested by them literally taking turns carrying the instruments up the mountain. And then, after Reina shared her heart and soul with Kumiko, the two sit down to make music together. They're playing the same tune in perfect harmony, two people becoming one. But now, it's clear that Kumiko has betrayed Reina. She asks Reina to play music all alone. And so, Reina plays a melody from Liz and the Blue Birds, an in-universe story about an impossible friendship between a human girl and a bird. And in this metaphor, Reina is the bird, the only one who still aspires to reach the skies, whereas Kumiko has become grounded trapped somewhere between heaven and earth. 
Yet, there's nothing that better illustrates Kumiko's inner conflict than the pair of candied fruits that accompany her in the two scenes. At first, these seem to serve as spoils from Kumiko's date with Shuichi, a saccharine treat to be shared by the two prospective lovers. But as it turns out, this second one isn't for Shuichi, it's for Reina. Unfortunately, however, by the time Kumiko can give it to her friend, Reina's orange got cracked. Kumiko wanted to share the bounty of the world below with the last person remaining at the top, but by doing so, she broke the covenant that united them. And yet, despite all that, the fragile beauty of the shots with the candied orange still betrays that an intimate bond persists between the two soulmates, despite everything. In what proceeds, we saw Shuichi going for the kiss and getting a slap to the face for his audacity. This rejection is perfectly juxtaposed to Kumiko taking a bite off of Reina's candied orange. Take your average Japanese romance series, and you're sure to find a moment where someone gets worked up about sharing an indirect kiss. I don't know, I just love the contrast between how Kumiko erects clear boundaries with Shuichi versus how nonchalantly, unwittingly even, she engages in, you know, quite intimate contact with Reina. Okay, I want to zoom out a bit and look at the Kitauji Orchestra more broadly. So let's talk about names. A new year at Kitauji also means adding new members to the cast, and as this is sound euphonium, that naturally involves focusing on the accompanying interpersonal tensions. That comes out most strongly at the beginning of the film, where we hone in on the newcomers to the bass section. The issue of integrating the first years into the club is channeled through one avenue in particular namely through how the newcomers should be addressed. For one, there's Motomuts Kinaga, who insists on being called by his first name, as he seems to have a bit of a complex about his unusual surname. Then we get introduced to a duo who have been together since elementary school and even share a surname, Satsuki and Mirei Suzuki. But where Satsuki immediately jumps to nicknames, Mirei markedly avoids doing so. And more than that, Mirei snaps when Satsuki keeps calling her by a nickname. In Japanese more than in English, the way people address each other says a lot about their relationship to each other. So when the newcomers express their preferences for how others should call them, what they're actually doing is carving out a position for themselves within a new social circle. And through the act of naming alone, the film communicates the key facets of their respective personalities. Motomu is someone with his fair share of insecurities. Satsuki prioritizes making friends over her musical accomplishments. And Mirei puts up barriers between herself and her bandmates. And then there's the new euphonium player, Kanade Hisaishi who thinks it's silly how worked up her peers are getting about something as trivial as naming conventions. Now, I'll discuss Kanade in more detail later, but one of her most major flaws is that she prioritizes keeping up appearances over her actual wishes and desires. So when she callously dismisses her peers' naming preferences, it shows that she fundamentally misunderstands how to forge meaningful relationships with others. Anyways, Mireille is the centerpiece of the film's first major storyline. As the story progresses, the tensions between her and Satsuki boil over. And the root cause of this turns out to be that Mireille is under the assumption that musical aspirations and making friends don't go hand in hand. And so, it's eating away at her that Satsuki is getting along with her clubmates while she's toiling away at the tuba. In the deepest corners of her heart, she desires human connections just as much as success in the ensemble. Finally, Kumiko intervenes. She convinces Mirei that these two aren't actually mutually exclusive, and recommends a first step that Mirei can take to close the distance with her bandmates. 
lets others call her by her nickname. The underlying point, changing her name is tantamount to changing her relationship with those around her. But while all this fits in with Sound Euphonium's overarching themes, I believe that this material also serves to be read in light of Kumiko's own struggles in her second year. The Kumiko from the film is markedly conflicted about her potential relationship with Shuichi. So here's, I think, the connection between the first year's concerns with their appellations and Kumiko's romantic troubles. Unlike her juniors, Kumiko doesn't know what to call the relationship between herself and Shuichi. Childhood friends? Bandmates? Lovers? It's not just with Shuichi, however, that Kumiko is wavering and uncertain. For one, she's lost on what to do after high school. And here, too, the hill scene juxtaposes her to Reina. During their meeting, Reina boldly proclaims that she wants to become a professional musician. And upon hearing this, Kumiko goes quiet. She doesn't have any aspirations of her own at this point, and she feels a bit inadequate compared to Reina. But more than that, Kumiko is also uncertain about the role she wants to play within her club. During her second year, she gets assigned to help integrate the first years who have never played an instrument before. To me, it's not quite clear if Kumiko actually enjoys this role. There's a scene where band director Noboru Taki asks her how she's finding the task. But before Kumiko can even formulate a reply, Taki answers in her stead. And so, she can simply agree with the socially acceptable response. And just like how Kumiko is contrasted to Reina in terms of future plans, she's also set apart from her partner in the welcoming committee, third-year student Tomoe Kabe. Unlike Kumiko, Kabe was a beginner in her first year of high school, and so she knows all the stumbling blocks that the newcomers might face. Moreover, there's a moment in her meeting with the first years where Kumiko is put on the spot by a difficult question. But as all the eyes are on Kumiko, Kabe chimes in and reassures the new students. Kabe is in complete control, unlike, by implication, her hesitant junior. So with all this, the film communicates that Kabe is the perfect person for the job. And towards the end of the film, Kabe announces that she will step down from the orchestra and fully focus on supporting them in the capacity of club manager. Kabe has essentially realized that she's juggling too many balls at once and chose to commit to her mentoring role. In other words, Kabe will now lead the club forward by tapping into her greatest strength. All that, of course, begs the question how Kumiko compares to Kabe. Over the course of the film, Kumiko has taken on a massive amount of responsibilities. Excelling at music, sustaining her friendships, giving romance a try, and helping to integrate and nurture the new generation. Yet, by trying to do everything, she's succeeding at nothing. That's the sum of her second year. To her credit, Kumiko realizes this towards the end of the film. And so, she meets up with Shuichi one more time, and essentially pulls the plug. She gave it some thought, and thinks it's better to call it quits for now, rather than keeping at it half-heartedly. And that really seems to be for the best. At least, the last shot of Kumiko and Shuichi is one where they both feel that a weight has fallen off their shoulders. So now, it's finally time to talk about Kanade, who is probably the second most important character in the film. Kanade is introduced as Kitauji's new euphonium player, continuing the trend of having one euphonium for each year. And a new euphonium is just what's needed. After all, there's a massive hole to fill now that the prodigy Asuka has graduated. What's most striking about the new euphonium player is how consistently she's paralleled to Kumiko. When she first appears, Kanade is hesitant about joining the club, and even hides that she plays the euphonium, just like Kumiko had done at the start of her first year. 
Furthermore, Kanade is quick to pick up on and get tangled up in all the intricacies of the club's social dynamics, which is arguably Kumiko's most notable quality throughout the series. It's telling then that these are the two to go after Mire when she has her outburst. Kanade seems to be following in Kumiko's footsteps as a socially acute problem solver. All in all, the numerous similarities between them explain why Kanade quickly displays a warped fondness for Kumiko, and even claims that Kumiko is the only one in the club she respects. Towards the end of the film, it's finally revealed why it has been playing up the similarities between the two euphonium players, and why Kanade has become fixated on our senior. One of its ongoing storylines revolves around the tensions between Kanade and the club's third-year vice president and fellow euphonium player Natsuki Nakagawa. Throughout its runtime, it's hammered home that Kanade is a better performer than Natsuki. Yet, once the club holds its annual auditions, Kanade deliberately puts on a bad performance, and Natsuki calls her out for doing so. This is when the truth finally comes out. Kanade has gone through the same kind of traumatic experiences in middle school as Kumiko. Both girls took the spot of a senior student, resulting in them being ostracized for growing too big for their boots. By implication, both Kumiko and Kanade have developed a highly sophisticated social radar as a survival mechanism. Their experiences taught them to appease their seniors and to avoid sticking out their neck from the crowd. And note also that Kumiko went through a similar ordeal when she and not Natsuki got to play in the competition during season 1. All this serves to establish that Kanade basically falls victim to the same fears and insecurities as Kumiko during her last year. These parallels are also explicitly drawn by Kanade herself when she finally unveils why she threw the audition. Kanade saw lots of herself in Kumiko and accuses her of putting on an act, just like she's been doing. And when Kumiko denies the allegations, Kanade tells her to look into a mirror. But in an ironic sense, the film shows us that Kumiko doesn't really need a mirror. After all, she's facing her spitting image. That's when the camera pans down and shows us the two girls' reflections in the rainwater. At their lowest point, the two were mirror images of each other. Kanade says as much herself. She sees in Kumiko a kindred spirit, someone who's detached, observes from a distance, and uses her tact to avoid making enemies. Now, bear with me for a moment, because what this scene made me realize is that our entire perception of Kumiko might be the result of the story being focalized through the protagonist. Basically, that the entire story is shot in a way to underscore her viewpoint. With that, I don't mean that every moment is literally shot from Kumiko's perspective. Let me illustrate what I mean with an example. Here's from season 2. When Kumiko tries to persuade Asuka to rejoin the band, the camera focuses on bugs trapped in a spider web. A metaphor for Asuka entangling Kumiko in her own words. And then we get angles like these ones, of Asuka eyeing Kumiko like a predator, and slowly closing in. These shots aren't neutral. The focus and angles are reflective of Kumiko's terror as she finds herself under attack. After all, Asuka surely wouldn't see herself as a hideous repulsive creature in this situation. Rather, these are details that you would only highlight if you are intent on showing the encounter from Kumiko's perspective. So the reflection in the rain scene, to me, raises the question if we have been viewing this series from a biased perspective all along. Throughout the film, Kumiko is the sympathetic protagonist, whereas Kanade is framed as an unpredictable, even somewhat unsettling presence. Let me show what I mean by this by having another look at the scene of Kanade claiming that she only respects Kumiko. 
By all means, this seems to be a genuine compliment. And yet, every frame communicates something different. The scene starts with Kanade asking Kumiko whether Satsuke or Mire is more devoted to the club, and which of them she prefers. And note how this moment is shot from behind a fence. Again, this perspective implies that Kumiko is being trapped. Then, Kanade offers Kumiko a drink, but as she steps forward, she's obscured by the tree. Kumiko can't see what Kanade's intent is, and that is underpinned by Kanade being partly out of sight, whereas Kumiko is fully visible. And then there's the lighting. It's dusk, the sinister harbinger of night. So with all this build-up, it's hard not to assume that Kanade has some ulterior motive when she eventually butters up her bandmates. In that light, it's interesting to note that Kumiko's friend Midori likens Kanade to a cuddly kitten, whereas that's not at all how Kanade comes across throughout the film. Apparently, Kanade doesn't seem so downright threatening from others' perspectives. Rather, it looks like this presentation of Kanade is the result of the events being focalized through Kumiko. But that begs only further questions. Given the way the story parallels Kanade to Kumiko, does this mean that Kumiko herself would come across like Kanade to some of her bandmates? And secondly, what does it say about Kumiko that she views the person who most clearly resembles herself in the entire series as such a hostile presence? Well, we can go off of Kumiko's own words here. She recognizes in Kanade the parts of herself that she most despises. But at the same time, Kumiko also knows that this isn't all she has going for herself. And here's the crux. Deep in her heart, Kumiko knows that these qualities are what's holding her back from becoming, and say it with me, someone special. This might well be the climactic moment of the entire film. Up to this point, Kumiko hasn't uttered the magical phrase one single time. But now that she's having a heart-to-heart -heart with someone who's effectively her younger self, it's as if she's finally allowed to say something that she felt she had outgrown. Kumiko Omai still wants to become someone special by playing the euphonium. The dream is not dead. Yet, there's still something incredibly poignant about this scene. At least to Kanade, Kumiko's monologue is not at all convincing. And why would it be? Kumiko only attached such weight to the phrase she's parroting from Reina because Reina walked the walk. Kumiko saw for herself how Reina fought back against the soul-crushing mob mentality of her orchestra at every step of the way. Kumiko, however, hasn't been giving that same example and there's nothing she can say now to assuage her junior. With the complete absence of the role model that Kumiko had, Kanade holds on to the lie that she's come to believe, that there's no point in toiling at her instrument since you will just fail and nobody will celebrate your achievements. So in other words, Kumiko has effectively failed her younger self. And talking about failing, that's exactly what Kitauji does next. Despite all the efforts that someone like Kanade has clearly put into her performance, Kitauji lands the infamous dud gold in the prefectural competition. And with that, all its hopes and dreams have been snuffed out. In year two, Kitauji goes out with a whimper. This loss seems to provide narrative validation for Kanade's nihilistic worldview. They worked off their bones, have suffered all this interpersonal drama, and they've got nothing to show for themselves. Rather, they're looking like idiots. Which, as the film repeatedly showcases, is the worst form of punishment for someone who's deeply concerned with keeping up appearances. Right before they perform at regionals, Kanade asks Kumiko if she's always been so passionate about the euphonium so passionate that she's willing to put up with all the labor that's necessary for a spectacular performance. 
Of course, this wasn't the case at all for Kumiko. She only became serious about her instrument after she witnessed Reina cry her heart out upon receiving the Dodd Gold in middle school. That's where Kumiko found out how much you can truly care and how much she'd been holding herself back. So as the Kitauji Orchestra drives off from the competition, Kumiko finally pricks through Kanade's defenses. How is she truly feeling after experiencing such a narrow defeat? And out comes the phrase that changed Kumiko's life two years prior. I'm so frustrated, I could die. And with that, the camera pans out. At last, heaven is in sight again. So what's the takeaway from all this? As I noted before, Kumiko has been failing Kanade for most of the film. She's met a girl who is tormented by the same inner demons as she used to be at the start of the series, right at the time when her own resolve has been faltering. And yet, it would of course also be ludicrous to think that Kumiko could be the reina to Kanade. She's simply not that kind of headstrong, resolute figure. Kumiko Omai is someone who wavers, who doubts, who fails. That's the contrast the entire film has been playing up between the two friends. And yet, right before the credits roll, Kumiko managed to become for Kanade what Reina was to her, but through her own merits. Kumiko is someone who is tactful, observant, empathetic. And so, she doesn't waltz over Kanade. Rather, she's been peering into her junior's heart and knows what she's truly feeling deep down. And so, at the end of her trials, Kumiko proves herself worthy as a leader in her own right after all. Worthy of becoming the Kitauji Concert Band's next president in the following year. So to everyone who's tuned in until the end of this video, thanks so much for following me along this ride. Making these videos has really consolidated my love for this story, and I can't tell you how excited I am to finally see its conclusion starting in the following weeks. I'm sure I'll cover season 3 at some point as well, so hopefully I'll see you there.